Spent 28 years on active duty and retired in 1995. Uh, spent most of his career working as an intelligence officer. Uh, worked for SAC, and uh, I've got the acronym, but I really don't even know what it is. Uh, JSDPS. Uh, his book on uh, Stalag Love Three is basically considered, you know, the best book that there is out there. And um, without any any further uh, comments on my part, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Arthur Durant. More earlier, but the time has finally come. A special thank you to the combat combat veterans that are here. This is why we're here. Um, I hope I wish this could go on forever. And I guess I'm curious: Do we have any former Stalag Luft three? Prisoners here? They're all here. They're all here. <laughs> the important ones anyway, right? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to uh, also thank the Historical Society, the 8th Air Force Historical Society, and I'll get back to the importance of their work in a little bit. But for all you've accomplished, all of you here, when I was focused on Stalag Luft III, I knew about you, but I never saw you up close. This has been a really, really special privilege, and is a special privilege. Uh, we thank you for giving us the stage time today. We know you've got a busy schedule. I'd like to thank Greg Hatton for all of his pioneering work in all of this. And again, by the time I finish, I'll try to emphasize why this is just becoming so extremely important. Guys. I was asked to speak a little bit about changing perspectives on POWs, and so I wanted to begin with just a very, very brief history. Many of you know this, but many don't, and especially perhaps the second generation, so I'm going to cover this very quickly. Uh, we won the war, and that was, that was great. And after the war, we sort of needed time to heal our wounds, and Bruce Norfleet's uh, video is going to highlight a very important part of this, and that is I don't think I ever spoke to a POW who didn't have a twinge of guilt uh, as to why they were a POW, and it was always like if I had just dove a little faster or climbed a little faster or zigzagged here or there, I would still be in the war. Instead, here I am rotting in this prison camp. Totally unjustified, as we know, with logic, but emotion is different, and they all felt that, and so there needed to be that healing time. Fortunately, there has been some healing time, uh, but the second thing was it gave a chance for these people to tell their story, and a wonderful story, a wonderful series of stories. The results were very, very good. Uh, many lessons learned, and those of you who have kept track of what goes on in Siri training today, uh, survival, escape, uh, evasion, and, or, yeah, and rescue, uh, you would see so many lessons pulled from your experiences, even if you didn't end up in a POW camp. It's been a fantastic process to watch how many lessons were learned. And I can't emphasize enough what an inspiration you have all been to the younger generation. But the ground is shifting under our feet. Uh, go back very quickly to World War II and cover just a few of the highlights. About 90,000 Americans became POWs. Because of the large numbers, uh, the estimate was, for example, Germany alone held about 10 million POWs at one time, including, of course, the Russians. Under those circumstances, they had no choice but to use communal living. That is now history. It no longer happens. But that communal living presented some very unique opportunities as well as challenges. You can't just talk about POWs. They have so many faces, depending on what their experience was. And so, for example, in the European theater, when we looked at the Russians, they were almost faceless. And that's because the Russians didn't sign the Geneva Accords and some other problems that arose between Russia and Germany, uh, neither side observed the Geneva Accords in the least. And there was a very intentional effort on Hitler's part to not only capture Russian territory, but to clear it of all human beings there. That was the German living room, 
and he issued an order which exempted all of his military personnel from any consequences for any action they would take against anybody from the East. That was a blanket order uh, because they considered them untermenschen, something other or under human beings. Uh, Eastern Europeans in general suffered exactly the same fate unless they somehow got into English hands and joined the English forces. Then they were generally given that flight protection, but those were very few and far between. Uh, the Western POWs had quite a different experience, and it's one of the split personality things about that war. As we know, generally speaking, they were treated well, and that's partly because both the Germans and the Western powers did sign the Geneva Accords, and they observed it in principle, if not in deed, but it went well beyond that. Huge differences in treatment, depending on the branch of the service that was involved. Uh, the Navy, actually, we don't know much about the Navy. Hear very little, see very little written, unless I just haven't come across it. And I would welcome any input <clears throat> any of you have on how the Navy was treated. But generally speaking, the service personnel were segregated out. The uh, Army, uh, not good treatment. Generally suffered uh, substa substandard diet and so on. I remember after uh, interviewing a number of prisoners, I came across an Army prisoner. And he said, I could always tell in the shower who was an Army prisoner and who was an Air Force prisoner because the Air Force prisoners had buttocks. <laughs> but that is too simplistic also. Uh, generally speaking, the Air Force prisoner, prisoners were treated the best. There's a lot of controversy as to why that occurred. Most of the evidence points towards Herman Goering and his World War I experience and the sense of chivalry he developed, but that may be too generous. Probably a, uh, a more complete answer is that after the fall of France, the Germans got all of their prisoners back. The only ones they were losing primarily were over England, the Battle of England, those were all flyers. And so he basically appealed to Hitler and said, for reasons of reciprocity, we need to treat our Air Force prisoners well so they treat our German prisoners well. But that's still very much up in the air. Uh, but generally speaking, the officers did receive much better treatment, and that was partly by the Geneva Accords. And the whole principle there was that the officers must not be demeaned in front of their troops, and therefore they could not be made to work in the same way that the enlisted troops were. The enlisted troops definitely got worse treatment. And my heart goes out to them. Um, they, uh, they just had a much rougher time of it. And it wasn't a matter of leadership. They exhibited the kind of leadership that you would hope to find anywhere. In most cases, they're all exceptions. But they did quite well. It's just they didn't have the wherewithal to do the kinds of things that the officers were able to do. So what do we say about Stalag Luft III? I won't dwell on this, but it did get the reputation of being the country club of prison camps. But I've got to tell you, even this is deceptive. First of all, I don't think there's any such thing as a country club of prison camps. But also, but also, those prisoners, they exhibited so much of the attitude I saw in so many of you. When you went through their documentation, it was censored, heavily censored. And the principle was the senior officers established a rule that said nothing negative goes out of this camp. Our loved ones are suffering enough. They do not have to worry about us anymore. So you will say nothing negative, only positive. Well, if you do enough of that, the image starts to be created that this was a country club among the prison camps. But it wasn't. Uh, there was no such thing as a country club of prison camps. But this much we do know, the conditions were much worse in the enlisted camps. But the plight of the POWs has been changing rapidly, and a very significant turning point occurred in the Korean War. And some of you may be aware that that war, uh, a book was written about that war, which said, in every war but one. And the principle behind that book was, in every war but one, American POWs acquitted themselves well, but not in this war. And as you may know, a number of them uh, actually uh, turned over to the North Korean side and voluntarily made statements against the United States and actively worked against our, or for our defeat. And after the war, there was a lot of question, how, why did this happen? 
uh, it is interesting to note, whoops, I got a little bit ahead of myself. One of the things the North Koreans themselves said is that they were able to indoctrinate those men much easier than they thought because so many of them didn't know their own history. And so they could distort it and make them believers. But what really came to play here was a different philosophy on prisoners of war. The Geneva Accords are designed on the principle of that a, a prisoner is merely a, uh, is a soldier who has been disarmed and therefore he is basically returned to civilian status and needs to be treated accordingly. That's a prisoner of war. But starting in Korea, the North Koreans uh, use the prisoners as propaganda pawns and in that sense the, prisoner them, the prisoners themselves became part of the weapons of war. Now, I, I got to go back and say something else here about the prisoner of war concept. This is not to be confused with the efforts that went on in World War II by the prisoners to do as much as they could to help their country even while in captivity. And that included things like passing coded messages back to Washington and getting debriefed, passing that information so they became targets. Uh, some of that stuff went beyond the pale of the Geneva Convention, but everybody understood this was total war. And nobody really got too energized about that, although everybody knew if you got caught red-handed, you could be charged as a spy. But that was one level of being a prisoner at war, but it took a, a gigantic leap in the Korean War when the prisoners themselves became instruments of war, in this case, propaganda tools. And so the terminology changed to prisoner at war war. Um, <clears throat> now, out of the Korean War did come some good things, including the code of conduct. All of you knew the name, rank, and serial number routine, but uh, not many of you went through the kind of grilling routine that happened in Korea and later Vietnam and all the rest. And that code of conduct became just absolutely body and soul for every serviceman after that. Among other things, it said you will resist to the best of your ability, but please do understand they can get you and they will get you. And you do not need to be a John Wayne and go down. Uh, you resist to the best of your ability and then you make the best of the situation that's left. That was a huge breakthrough in terms of the new interrogation techniques that were used. Now, one of the problems with World War II is you had people like Hans Scharf who claimed that he got everything he ever needed without ever laying a finger on anybody. But again, the situation is changing. That was true because most crewmen knew very little of the big picture. They knew their missions, they knew a lot of different things, but they didn't know the big picture. But if you had a really high-ranking POW fall into their hands, I would place no bets on no torture. Uh, they would get what they needed to get, and of course, once you got out of the military ranks, then it was free game for everybody. Uh, Vietnam only added to this quagmire. Uh, clearly, here, the prisoners were prisoners at war, propaganda tools, and, of course, the whole idea the Geneva Convention just flew totally out of the window. And one of the odd things that's changing our environment today is much of the world has chosen to ignore that. And I thought one of the real ironies of the Vietnam War is if you look at the geography, there's no way one country could attack another without involving a third, fourth, or fifth. And yet somehow the North Vietnamese convinced the entire world that they were not involved in any other countries. And so when we went into Cambodia, suddenly it was a great extension of the war. We went into Cambodia because <laughs> that, was, that was North Vietnam extended. Yeah, but somehow that, that seemed to go by everybody. Yes, some verbal condemnation, but no repercussions to speak of for the fact that they violated Geneva Accords freely. Now, what contributed to that, of course, was partly the controversies about all of that war, uh, the Cold War versus domino effect versus uh, uh, the, the whole idea that it was a civil war or, to use current terminology, a war of liberation in the post-colonial period. So that may not be our best guide, but as we continue with the Gulf War of the present, the waters only get more murky. Now there are two views that you'll see bouncing around. One is <clears throat> that the Geneva Accords are in shambles, 
and nobody really knows what the rules are anymore. Although a lot of lip service and once in a while a lot of publicity is given, virtually no consequences for violating the Geneva Accords, at least for most participants. Now somehow the United States does get held to a much higher standard as we've seen with all the controversy at Guantanamo Bay and so on. But there's another side of the coin that says, but you know, this is really nothing new. If you look at what happened between the Germans and the Russians, or the Japanese and all of their enemies, uh, the Geneva Accords just didn't play a role at all in their thinking, and it's partly because their own cultures allowed no room for that. As most of you know, the Japanese culture basically said, if you surrendered, you, you deserve the worst treatment you could get. You were lower than a dog. You really were obligated to die for your country. And they did. So if our people didn't die for our country, obviously, we deserve to be treated lower than a dog. Some conclusions. We're in new territory, folks. The storytelling, oh, priceless, absolutely priceless. Lessons learned, priceless. But we can't take it for granted that this is always going to be the case, that people are going to receive it this way. A lot of evidence that they aren't. Uh, I, would, I did want to mention one thing that's affecting new perspectives on research. I was sort of unfortunate but also fortunate. I started my research in 1973, no computers, <laughs> uh, not the internet. I traveled all over the United States, England, Canada, uh, Germany. It took me 13 years to do my research. Almost all of it came out of attics. There was nothing in the archives. But I was able to get my arms around the available resources. I did other things for about 20 years. And once you get in, as some of you know in the military, once you get in a strategic air command sack, they got you. <laughs> and uh, I devoted 15 hours a day there for many, many years. And it wasn't until I retired that I came back to the surface and looked around and I realized the whole world of research and writing on this had changed. And to the better, but it does have some drawbacks too. Uh, but first of all, now almost everything is declassified. I just appeared on a National Geographic show that when I did my research, General Clark cornered me and he says, Durand, Captain Durand, <laughs> he says, you're gonna hear about certain things, I do not want you talking about them because we're still using them in Vietnam. And I adhered to that religiously, only much later to discover that others were publishing freely about it. And it's partly because it has become outdated now. And so a lot of this has become declassified uh, there's now a stupendous list of publications, documentaries, and I almost feel sorry for somebody wading into this today because they could spend two, three years or more just trying to catch up with the literature before they can figure out what still <laughs> needs to be covered. It's almost all out there in one form or another, but that doesn't mean the job is done. Uh, new research methods have opened up everything. I often think what I did in 13 years probably could be done a year or less now, and a lot more thoroughly than I ever imagined doing it. So those of you who are thinking about digging into this, don't hesitate. There's a world out there yet uh, that needs to be covered. Um, so the, the audience is no longer to be taken for granted. Uh, so we must strive diligently to ensure that the documentation that we do have is secure. And those of you who might still be holding things, uh, as long as you want to do that, that's great. But if you ever decide you need to give it up, uh, look for a good repository like 8th Air Force to get that to. Because the future generations just won't know. There's no way they can know. Uh, the story continues to be told, but it's so important that it continues to be told right. And this is going to be an uphill fight. It really is. As all of you pass away, you're taking with us a source of inspiration, as Greg pointed out, irreplaceable, irreplaceable. So upon the next generation comes a huge task, and that is somehow to capture the essence of your experience and your lessons learned in life and somehow convey that to the younger generation. Now, I need to end this on an upbeat note. I've given you kind of the downside, but I can assure you the thirst is still out there. The hunger is still out there. I teach a course on military history. 
It's always oversubscribed. The young students come, they know nothing. They know nothing about the military, haven't a clue. But yet, they understand that somehow a society is really vulnerable if it doesn't have a powerful military. And they want to learn. And your life, your life lessons, I can lecture all day and it means nothing, but if I can bring in your examples, suddenly they're electrified because you did it. And they say to themselves, maybe we need to figure out how to do this when our time comes. It's a very brief overview. I apologize for the brevity. We could go into so many of these subjects very, very deeply. Maybe future reunions, I don't know. <laughs> but thank you very much.